It's December, and the rains have arrived in southern Africa. In much of Africa, the endless cycle between wet and dry seasons dictates where animals go to satisfy their need for both food and water. This eternal struggle against the elements governs the pattern of life and death in Mana Pools, a remote wilderness on the banks of the Zambezi. Located downstream from Victoria Falls and Lake Kariba, Mana Pools National Park is one of Zimbabwe's best kept secrets. The woodland bordering the river is unique, for it's dominated by extraordinary trees, white acacias, which are leafless when everything else is green. Nestling among them are Mana's many pools, remnants of the Zambezi's meandering course. The largest is six kilometers long. The rains have turned the refuge into a well-stocked larder, full of animals. There are about 17,000 elephants in this part of Africa, but the majority spend most of the year far inland, well away from Mana and its pools. During the rainy season, numerous families of elephants, like this one, enter Mana's woodland to take advantage of the flush of nourishing foliage. For much of the year, the ground beneath the lofty acacias is relatively bare. However, the rains conjure up a carpet of grass, which attracts large numbers of grazing animals. For impala, the lambing season coincides with the glut of grass. The young form creches, because there's safety in numbers. Their parents are permanently alert for the slightest signs of danger. Out in the open, lions pose little threat, as long as the impala keep their distance. During the rains, herds of buffalo migrate into Mana for the good grazing. For a time, the tender leaves seem to be on everyone's menu. Even insects, like these beetles, join in the feast. But there are more exotic things to eat in Mana's secluded pools. Water hyacinths smother the surface of this one. These pretty plants are relished by elephants. Cattle egrets use the elephant as a beater for flushing out insects and frogs. The only elephants to reside permanently in Mana are a few big bulls. This is one of them. Much of their time is spent around the pools and the river, servicing their prodigious appetites. 
Baboons also have a taste for the flowers, but don't venture too far from the bank because they don't like getting their fur wet. With so much food, the animals can relax. And yet, during the dry season, some will be hard-pressed to survive. They've got big brains, and they're smart enough to manage on whatever food is available. The troop's leading male is tucking into the fruit of a sausage tree, which makes tough but wholesome eating. Each troop has its own foraging area. Although baboons from different groups sometimes mingle without incident, this time a purposeful invasion is taking place. The neighbours threaten a takeover, so a serious skirmish is inevitable. Fundamentally, this is a fight over the troops' essential food supplies. The defending baboons stand their ground, and the trespassers retire to their own part of the woods. Baboons must be able to protect their own territory with its fruiting trees and termite mounds if they're to get through the lean, dry period of the year. The victorious troop frequently forages along the pastures at the edge of the Zambezi, which is a haven for hippos. At this time of the year, they regularly haul out during the daytime to feed. The air is generally fresh, and the clouds which billow up during the afternoons protect the hippos' sensitive skin from being damaged by the sun. When finished, they can quickly return to the river. Around Christmas, at the height of the southern summer, there are frequent showers. Although the rain can be heavy, it's often very local and short-lived. Nevertheless, it leaves the land sodden and the pools full of water. By late afternoon, the clouds usually dissipate, making way for glorious sunsets. There's much excitement among the elephants. A cow has just given birth, and the others close in to protect the little calf. It's still bewildered and unsure of its feet, but inside the forest of legs, it's safe. The grown-ups are encouraging it to stand. Until it does so, it won't be able to reach its mother's breasts. Stimulated by the cloudbursts, termites choose this night to make their nuptial flights.
In response to the rains, the foam frogs launch their sexual orgies. Each female is joined by several smaller males which fertilize her eggs and help her make a nursery of froth. It's safer than consigning the tadpoles to the pool below, full of ravenous fishes. The heavy downpours produce another nocturnal event, catfish out of water. These fish were making a spawning run from the Zambezi into Mana's swollen streams, but the flash floods have suddenly subsided, leaving many of them stranded. As there are plenty of puddles, and the fish can gulp air, many will wriggle into one or other of Mana's many pools, where they'll breed. However, their long-term survival is a gamble. Most of the pools dry out when it gets hot. Most have made it into deep water by the time dawn has broken. The newborn elephant has survived its first night. It's still a little wobbly, so its mother has hung back while the rest of the troop has wandered off to feed. Soon, all the elephant families will migrate far inland to forage, so the calf has an arduous year ahead of it. Within a month or two, mana begins to dry out. The big herds have gone, and for those that remain, the daily drink is now essential, especially for impala. The vegetation on which they and the baboons are now feeding is not as lush as it was, and so they need extra water. As the river is full of crocodiles, the pools seem to be a safer option as places to quench their thirst. Ever cautious, impala feel especially open to attack when they're drinking. This pool is now a shrinking refuge for an old male hippo. He once commanded his own stretch of the Zambezi, but he was banished from the river by younger bulls. Throughout the day, the pools act as fast food restaurants, busy with the comings and goings of hungry and thirsty animals. A female kudu joins the party. Two months previously, bull elephants waded up to their bellies in this pool to reach the water hyacinths. Now the rafts of stranded weed are food for impala. It's rush hour for Lillian's lovebirds. Being seed eaters, they get virtually no moisture from their food, so they have to top up on water to complement their desiccated diet. After drinking, they'll spend the rest of the day in the bush. As the dry season gets underway and foliage starts to shrivel, the curious white acacia trees burst into leaf. As much of Mana's vegetation starts to wither, the acacias produce blossoms.
But the baboons have their eyes on a different kind of tree. The Feast of Figs is their last great treat of the year. Fig trees are the last to bear fruit before the heat tightens its grip on mana. Nothing is wasted. The climbers choose the juiciest ones. The less ripe fruit are discarded and devoured by the less enterprising animals on the ground. The older baboons know that they must take advantage of the bonanza of fruit while they have the chance, because there are lean times ahead. For the moment, the members of the troop are well fed and engage in social grooming, an activity which keeps even the most difficult to reach parts of their bodies clear of parasites. Mutual grooming also reinforces friendships between members of the troop. As it becomes drier, the baboons will need all their wits about them to scratch a decent living. But some creatures will do well. The lions of Mana won't have far to go to find their victims. Many antelope are commuting to the waterholes, but the absence of ground cover is a problem for the hunters. These prowlers, a lioness and her adolescent son, have been well and truly spotted. Waterbark monitor the lion's movements, so they won't be taken by surprise at least for the moment. The odds will be more in the lion's favor after the sun has gone down. After dark, one of Africa's most powerful excavators is at large. The aardvark is the only creature that can dig its way into massive termite mounds. Against its sturdy claws, the insect's earthen defences are no match. Once breached, the aardvark licks up his tiny prey. Under the veil of darkness, a young waterbuck on its way to the river walked straight into the lioness's ambush. Hyenas, the lion's eternal rivals, are quickly on the scene. Attracted by the sound of the kill and the smell of the freshly opened carcass, the hyenas hope to take over the lion's feast. Their wailing chorus attracts reinforcements. When the rest of the clan turn up, the hyenas stand a chance of seeing off the lioness. But not yet.
young male is attracted by the commotion. His mother is still supporting him. She kills for both of them. Even with 20 hyenas lurking in the darkness, the lions are unwilling to sacrifice their night's work. Hyenas are nothing if not patient. At the termite mound, the aardvark has finished his meal. And as it returns to its burrow, work begins on repairing the broken walls. The termites plug the holes with pellets of moist clay which set as hard as concrete. The job will never be completed by sunrise. The aardvark made too much damage. By dawn, the hyenas are still hanging on. The lions are irritated by their presence, and the young male asserts his authority by provocatively placing his strong-smelling dung among them, a warning that he rules here. The hyenas think otherwise. A dominant female destroys the lion's pungent pile and overlays it with her own sharp scent. It's an insult the lions cannot ignore. So far, the hyena's vigil hasn't paid off, but sooner or later their patients might be rewarded with the lion's leftovers, a few pieces of skin and bone. At sunrise, many animals are active before it becomes too hot. The baboons are now on meagre rations and have already discovered the damaged termite mound. As some of the tiny insects are still visible, they fall prey to the baboons' nimble fingers. Feeding on titbits is hard work. However, the exposed termites are in much greater peril from much smaller foes, Matabele ants. Alerted by their scouts, a column of these savage ants emerge from their nest and weave their way through the African bush. Although termites in their sealed nests are in no danger from these predatory insects, when they're exposed, they're easy prey. Against battalions of aggressive ants, even the well-armed soldier termites are overwhelmed.
As the death toll mounts, the slaughtered termites are temporarily stockpiled behind the battlefront, leaving the warrior ants free to return to the fray. The outcome of the conflict is inevitable. Soon the victorious Matabele ants carry jaw loads of their victims back to the nest where their queen and grubs reside. After several months, mana continues to bake beneath the scorching sun. Some of the pools have now shrunk to a critical level, and the fish are in serious trouble. This is what the Maribu storks have been waiting for. Thousands of catfish are stirring in the mud. There are so many, the Maribus don't know where to start. In the deeper water, the yellow-billed stork searches by touch, beak poised to snap onto its prey. But catfish don't succumb easily. They're equipped with very effective defences. When seized, they erect needle-sharp fins which stick out sideways and make them difficult, if not dangerous, to swallow. The birds learn to crush the spines or stun the fish before consuming their catch. A saddle-billed stork joins the banquet. The males are the most colourful of the family. Maribus are the vultures of the stork world. They often turn up at carcasses, and they're very competitive. A gathering like this can fish out a pond in days, and then the birds move on to another one. As the dry season progresses, Mana's resident bull elephants spend most of their time by the Zambezi. Their food in the acacia woodlands is becoming scarce, but the river banks and islands in the middle of the river are still fairly green. These great tuskers are big enough to wade across the channels without fear of being attacked by crocodiles. They'll spend hours at a time grazing with the sun beating down on their backs. And when they get too hot, they can join the hippos to cool off.
When the bulls return to the acacia woodlands, their regular route takes them close to a colony of carmine bee eaters. They are one of Africa's most vivid birds. They turn up to breed on the banks of the Zambezi during the hottest and driest months of the year. The cliffs carved out by the flowing water are ideal for them. Overlooking the river, the colonies are fairly safe and the two meter long nesting burrows are easy to excavate in the sandy soil. Carmine bee eaters feed by hawking damsel and dragonflies over the river and catching insects around the animals that come to graze and drink. Fierce evaporation is daily reducing the size of Mana's inland pools. For many of the residents, including baboons, which have relatively restricted territories, the Zambezi is too far away to walk, so they rely upon their local watering hole for as long as possible to slake their thirst. The maribus have fished out most of the pools. This one has little to offer. Perhaps the last catfish? The lone bull hippo is doomed. The tepid water now hardly covers his skin. If the conditions become intolerable, the maribus at least can fly away, whereas the baboons have no option but to remain in mana. Impala become very stressed during the dry season. These antelope need good grazing as well as water to keep them in good health. Lions always seem uncomfortable in the heat. By midday, the lioness is so parched that she's forced to brave the sun to look for water. The young male still trails her. They're both looking rather emaciated and are clearly finding life a struggle. In the absence of the migratory herds, their prey is somewhat thin on the ground. Now their priority is to get out of the sun and retire to the coolest patch of shade close to the waterhole. The smallest pools have either completely dried up or are reduced to patches of glutinous mud. This one still contains just enough liquid to attract a few African wild dogs. Mana Pools is one of the last refuges in Zimbabwe for this beleaguered species. In the Zambezi Valley there are several packs which have enough space to breed and hunt without human interference. These belong to a pack of 22, and they'll all join up to hunt at sunset, when mana cools down. Towards the end of the dry season, mana is at its emptiest. But the situation is about to change. After six months, the migratory herds return. Way inland, there's still food, but the water holes are now dry. So with nothing to drink, the animals must come back to Mana. After a long absence, the elephant families are back once again.
After their weary trek, they're thirsty. Bypassing Mana's near empty pools, they head straight for the Zambezi. In Mana, there is always water to drink for those able to commute to the river. Mana Pools is now at its busiest. The presence of life-sustaining water acts as an irresistible attraction for the big herds. And this is what makes Mana such an important sanctuary in this part of Africa. Once watered, the animals need to eat, but the grass has gone, and much of the dry foliage is of little value as food. During this critical period, the white acacias come to the rescue of the hungry herds. Almost at the peak of the dry season, each tree produces about half a ton of nourishing pods. Baboons can shin up the trees, and so are among the first to benefit from the crop. However, it's Mana's mighty bull elephants which play a key role in reaping the harvest. With their long reach, the biggest ones can rip whole branches off the trees. Everything is eaten, leaves, pods and twigs. These animals create a browse line higher than a two-storey house. The elephants have another way of gathering pods and making them more widely available for the other inhabitants of Mana. But the baboons don't want to be in the treetops when the elephants set to work. With five tons behind it, a bull elephant can shake down a shower of pods from the most inaccessible parts of the canopy. By attacking the acacias, the bulls litter the barren ground beneath the trees with tasty morsels. The fallen pods attract the females and their calves, who are unable to reach even the lowest branches in the acacia woodland. It's a wonder that elephants bother with such small fare. But as the seeds inside are rich in protein, the effort of picking up pods for hours on end is worthwhile, providing enough can be consumed. The elephants can't possibly collect every one, so other creatures profit from their enterprise. With little else to eat in the woodlands, the fruiting acacias help a whole range of animals eke out a living during the final stages of the dry season. Eland have also migrated into Mana to feed on the pods. But the bonanza is brief. Soon the supply of pods is exhausted. Some of the seeds are even recycled. 
Ever resourceful, the baboons resort to sifting through elephant's dung for undigested seeds. Not exactly figs, but every digestible morsel will help them endure until the rains return. What little food is left is fast disappearing into the termites' protective tunnels. Dead wood, fallen foliage and elephant dung are all grist to the termites' mill. In Mana, termites consume as much vegetation as all the other animals put together. The race is on for the final scraps of food. Swarms of red-billed qualia scour the soil for the remaining seeds. By November, Mana's cupboard is virtually bare. Beneath the acacias, thousands of hooves render the dry vegetation to dust. Death is in the air. Vultures benefit from the ultimate misfortune of others. The old bull hippo has lost his fight for life. Hyenas have already ripped through the tough hide, enabling the scrum of vultures to get to work. With no fish left, maribous have taken to scavenging, using their long beaks to snatch pieces from the vultures' table. One of the hyenas returns for another bite to eat. These animals also do well when others are dying. With a mouth full of piercing, cutting and crushing teeth, hyenas are the ultimate butchers of the natural world. She won't let the vultures get near her choice chunk of rotting flesh. Birds are at the bottom of this pecking order. After nearly eight months without rain, the temperature is an oppressive 45 degrees and Mana is swathed in a sultry blue haze. To save energy, the animals are lethargic and take refuge in the shade. Far inland, there's still some fodder, but the daily journey back to drink would be beyond the animal's endurance. Faced with the dilemma between eating or drinking, access to the Zambezi wins the day. One last push, just in case. This parched basin was the abode of catfish. Hippos once wallowed here. But eventually, the suffocating heat brings salvation. Powered by the tropical sun, vigorous thermals carry the humid air aloft. A bracing wind heralds the approaching storms. At the end of November, the four-month wet season is about to begin.
water pours off the flooded land and the streams flowing into the Zambezi are turned into destructive torrents. For the drenched animals, the misery will be short-lived. For them, the rain will bring back the good life. This was a dry bed of scorching sand. With so much rain, the river will flow into the Zambezi for several months. Soon after the initial soaking, Mana's pools fill to the brim, and the woodland is once again flushed green. In the early morning light, Mana assumes the ambience of an African paradise. The inhabitants can now enjoy a benign period, when they have both plenty to eat and water to drink, until the dry season returns, as it surely will. And so the cycle between wet and dry continues. Each year, the passage of seasons with the alternation between feast and famine tests a new generation of animals which live in this little known corner of Africa, in Mana pools, on the southern bank of the Zambezi. Yes, I'm there.